bow your heads for the benefit of prayer. Our Father and our God, we come thanking you. As anxious as our hearts might be, we arrest our mind and even our spirit to hear a word from on high. After the ups and downs, the crises and calamities of the week, we need to hear from you. So open our ears and open our heart. Make the word alive for us today. Look out over the landscape of our lives. And if you find any item that may prove to be an impediment, dear Lord, move it in the name of Jesus. And so now in the, in the words of antiquity and our ancestors, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart prove acceptable in thine sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, might the people of God say amen. amen. Beloved, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Two things that I want to happen simultaneously. Media ministry, if you would find the Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 14, 15, the crescendo of the passage is verse 16. I've asked three of our ministers to approach the microphone and to read those scriptures in your hearing today as they are the biblical foundation for our preaching this still morning. It is the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14, 15, and 16. Now, here's how John begins. You will readily recognize the passage. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, inquiring, what must I do to be saved? Jesus responds, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must be born again. Now, verses 14, 15, and 16 is the extinction of that initial conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, mm. even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Amen. Verse 15, please. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Ah, and then the crowning verse of the passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Now, beloved, what I want to affix your mind on is that this ever-familiar passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that you know so very well, that you are probably able to recite without the benefit of the Bible. I mean, if you've been around church any period of time, there are two verses you surely know. One from the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The other from the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, what's important for me to have you know is that this passage, this phrase, this announcement, this declaration, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. Comes on the heels of Nicodemus's question. What must I do to be saved? And in part, beloved, the Bible is saying God loved you so much 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. Oh, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go through it again. Let's go through it again. <coughs> Here's the question on the part of Nicodemus. Lord, what must I do to be saved? The answer, ain't nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to be saved. Your salvation is the result of God loving the world so much that he gave his son. So there's nothing for you to do. All you have to do is believe. Woo. Are y'all hearing me? All right. Having established that, let me confess to you today that I spent the, ye the majority of yesterday parked in front of my television set. despite any and every effort on my part to move and relocate to another part of the house, I find, found myself drawn back to the big screen TV so that I could watch the activities inside of St. George Cathedral. That, that featured the nuptials of Harry and Meghan. Come on here, somebody. Now, I'm going to try to put this together. I'm going to try to put this together. Let me put my phone on vibrator or silence so it don't embarrass me this week like it did last week. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Beloved, today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh-oh, somebody going to get this in just a second. This is the Sunday that we remember seven weeks and a day after Passover. Seven weeks, 49 days. The day following the expiration of the seventh week, 49th day, the first day following that is the 50th day. It is called Pentecost, the day of Jubilee. It is a high celebration on the Christian calendar. Why? Because it is the day when the Spirit fell. Uh-oh, watch where I'm going now. But the Spirit didn't fall on an exclusive, parochial, narrowly defined, small group of Jews who have been chasing after Jesus. The Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, on a day when every ethnicity, every cultural expression, every racial diversity, a mixture of the faith community, in other words, when all God's children got together in the city of Jerusalem, God said, this is a good crowd to drop my spirit on. Can I talk in here? Can I sing like I want to? So now, so now, it, it occurs to me, it occurs to me, it occurs to me that if God used a celebrated day of diversity to drop his spirit over 2,000 years ago. It is more than mere coincidence that while the whole world was watching, a variety of ethnicities, a showcase of multiculturalism, oh glory, where a variety of faith communities, ecumenicity, 
and interface expression all were present at the same time. God dropped the message of love. <laughs> and with a worldwide audience that was watching what was going on in Windsor, the message came down. It's all about love. For God so Now, I got to say to you, I was fascinated by what I saw yesterday. This curious collection of God's children from various walks of life, different modes of worship, the new Duchess of Sussex had the creativity to put together not just a wedding, but a worship experience. Come on, come on, come on. Tell me when you watch. church. T -t Tell me you didn't notice that when Harry and Meghan were exiting the church, the music in the background was amen. <laughs> the way we sing, hey, come, come. <coughs> I I'm not denying the liturgical anthems and hymns, and I enjoy the cellists this 19-year-old wonder boy who dazzled us with his music, but it was certain and sure that Megan put an undeniable stamp of blackness. Come on, y'all know I'm talking right. She, she, put, she put an undeniable stamp of blackness. And despite the stiff British upper lip behavior where you can't say nothing, you can't do nothing, you can't clap, you can't applaud, you have to act like nothing bothers you. But when the song got to moving, and they put the camera on the audience, you saw some folk going like this. <laughs> then, then, let us not forget the shining moment of the entire afternoon. The right Reverend Michael Curry stood in the pulpit of St. George Cathedral. He was scheduled to give a homily. Queen Elizabeth says that no sermon at a wedding ought to be beyond two minutes. That's in your church. But this is Megan's party. When that brother read up, made mention of Martin Luther King and the Beatles. 
raised his voice and talked about love and the power of love and how far reaching and how much a difference love can make. When he struck that black idiom <coughs> of the African American hermeneutic, all I was waiting for, Brother Tim, was a B flat and him to say, Well, <laughs> come on, you. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, you, you thought he was going to go there. You really thought he was going to go there. Of course, now I think we had taken the queen and her family as far as they could go. <coughs> Not sure they could have gone any further than that. And then, beloved, I don't want you to miss this moment because the right reverend, and of course, how you saw him dressed yesterday is how you will see me dressed this week. Come on here, somebody. <laughs> the right Reverend Michael Curry not only gave us a brilliant display of preaching in the black tradition, I don't want you to overlook the significance of him being there in that role and in that position. Hello, somebody. Uh, he was there as the elected presiding person of the American Episcopal Church. He is the head honcho of all Episcopalians. Hello, somebody. No, no, okay. I don't have time to go into all the details. If you come to Bible study tomorrow night, <laughs> I'll give you the final points of the lesson. But, beloved, I need you to understand the significance of him as head of the Episcopal Church standing in the pulpit of an Anglican cathedral. And the reason that's significant is because the Episcopal Church broke off from the Anglican Church. Anglican means the Church of, of England. Are y'all hearing me? Now, now here's what's going to mess you up. Here's what's going to mess you up. The head of the Anglican Church is the Queen. The monarch of England is the head of the Church of England. The Archbishop of Canterbury is a subordinate to the Queen. Okay, so oh, no, you, you don't have it yet. You don't have it yet. You don't have it yet. So the head of the entire Anglican Church in an Anglican Cathedral is seated in a pew having to listen to the head person of the religion that broke off from them 300 years ago and he's a brother. Can I talk in here? Can I say a little honor? So he is the head of the Episcopal Church preaching to the head of the Anglican Church which is the host denomination of where the wedding is taking place. And he's a brother. <laughs> he's a descendant of the very people who you forced out of Africa and relocated against their will on American shores. Now, the descendant of those slaves 
have come back to your house, standing in your pulpit, preaching from your upper room, back to the head of the church that took us to America in the first place. I want you to look at God up in here and see God at work. Yeah! Yes! Yes! All right, all right. All right. Now, let me close. Let me close. Let me close. But let me say a word about Megan. There have been recent attempts to soften and make more available her acceptance. The royal family ain't crazy. about having a woman of color <coughs> in the family who is positioned to bear children who are technically in the line of succession to become the next king or queen of the British. Can I talk? Oh, come on here. So, so, so now, so now, so now. So, so now let me tell you, listen, don't, don't fall for the spin. So in an effort to kind of soften things, we have been told repeatedly, um, she ain't black. She biracial. They say, they, they, they say she, 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 you know, she, she. She has a, uh, a mixed heritage. Of course, now you saw her mama with them braids. Come on here, someone. Hey! Am I talking right? Am I talking right? Yeah! Oh, come on here, somebody. You know, you did see her mama. She, she had that hat cocked to the side. But under that hat was some cornrows. Can I talk in here? Now, <coughs> here's the problem I have. America, Fox News, why you want to change the rules now? Why do why, why you want to create a new definition. Right. Now, why isn't the old explanation that was good enough for the last hundred years, why doesn't that apply now that Harry has discovered that the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, stay with me. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me. When I was growing up in Daddy Luda's house, the rule was simple. If you have one drop of black blood, that means you're black. Quadroon, octoroon, no. if you have one drop, that means you're black. Now, Megan has multiple drops. Hello, somebody. Beloved. I'm going to say this and I'm going to try and sit down and eat some of Sister Ida's barbecue from yesterday. I'm going to try to give Daddy Luda some of her barbecue from yesterday. 
I'm not sure we either understand or appreciate the unique times in which we live. I want to say that Megan, oh, no, 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 excuse me, excuse me. Don't let me sound so familiar. We're talking about royalty. I'm trying to tell you that the Duchess of Sussex is as black as Barack Obama. All right, all right. I know it's going to mess with you. I know it's going to mess with you. But you heard the vicious rumors encircling Diana, Prince Charles's ex-wife. You know that there is speculation that the reason she is no longer with us, some say, is because after Charles, she started dating a man of color. And it horrified her family that she might bring forth children that have a mixed heritage and share a sibling re relationship with the crown prince and Harry. Y'all heard, listen, you heard it. You heard that, that, that the Secret Service, the British Secret Service may have been involved because British royalty could not stand the thought that their princess Diana may end up with a man of color. But I want you to look at God. <laughs> Diana ain't here, but her baby boy, can I talk of it here? has found, can I talk up in here, love <laughs> on his own terms. And what the British family feared with Diana will certainly come to pass with Harry and Meghan. So, I'm going on back to my seat. I'm going to sit down <laughs> and leave this message alone. I've hollered <laughs> long enough in this house, but I need <laughs> you to understand the unique times in which we live. You'll be able to tell your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren if you live long enough that you were here not only to see a black man in the White House, but to see a black woman in the Royal House. Is he all right? Is he all right? Can you say yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it is all right. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God so loved the world that he allowed you to live long enough to see blackness on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Hallelujah.